Acts chapter 2, uh, the very end. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, very uh, um, well-known verses. Um, so here we go, beginning in 42. And they v- devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Uh, So, uh, again, well-known verses about the functioning of the church. And I kind of want to start in the middle and work our way out. Uh, So I want to look at verses 44 and 45 uh, because I think that's going to help us a little bit with some of the fellowship stuff at the beginning. And then we'll work our way kind of back. But verses 44 and 45 say this. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, remember about the context here is right after uh, the day of Pentecost, Peter's preached. There was 120 believers gathered in Jerusalem. Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, and the Lord adds 3,000 to their number that day. So that's the context that this is coming out of. Uh, And I think it's important for us here, when we look at these verses, we have to determine, is this, is Luke being prescriptive or descriptive? And prescriptive would just mean um, Luke is prescribing something to the church, meaning that all subsequent bodies, all subsequent or following congregations need to model what's going on here. He's prescribing a method of behavior for us to apply or our own lives, or is Luke simply describing the way that this congregation, the first church, um, was behaving. And that matters because especially when we look at verses 44 and 45 there, um, where they're holding all things in common, they're selling all their possessions and belongings and distributing um, to uh, the proceeds that Aeneas has need. Um, we're not doing those. So that would be, be the first reason why this is important as to whether this is prescript or, or descriptive because the church just doesn't function this way anymore. So if it's prescriptive, we're disobeying, obviously. And then also, um, it's important because you know, these verses have been used to um, defend, um, support um, some dangerous and harmful ideologies throughout uh, the history of man. So we need to know. So let's look at a few evidences that would lead us to believe that this is descriptive, that Luke is not saying this is the way that every church, every congregation from here on out has to believe, but Luke is simply describing something, the way that the early Christians are behaving and what we can learn from that. So the first thing is this descriptive. Well, the first piece of evidence I would point to is just all the rest of the text, uh, all the rest of scripture. And we look at the rest of the epistles, especially Paul's letters, and what we see is that every congregation um, is not behaving the same way. Uh, There's a lot of grace, there's a lot of latitude in the way that God allows Christians um, uh, to function, uh, the way that God allows Christians to carry out the essential practices of the people of God. So every church we see in the New Testament, every congregation doesn't have to be functioning the exact same way. So we can apply that here, but also if we just look at the text um, in chapter 2 and then a little bit more in Acts what Luke says, then we know uh, that we don't have to be doing exactly what this church is doing. So let's think about Acts chapter 5, and we won't, I don't want to talk about too much because we'll get there in a little bit. But at the beginning, at the end of Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 32, we got kind of a repeat of what we had at the end of chapter 2. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So here we got again, that uh, here's the church, and both of these texts, Luke makes it seem like everyone is doing this. Here he says, and in chapter 2 he says all. Here he says for as many as who had. So if you had land or houses, apparently you were selling them. Now, we get to Acts chapter 5, and, and we'll get more into Ananias and Sapphira um, when we get there. But let's, let's point at a few verses here, verses 3 and 4. 
uh, Ananias and Sapphira sell some land and they go to the apostles and they bring part of the money and they say, we sold it for this much. So they're taking uh, credit for more than what they actually gave. Um, and of course, um, uh, Peter finds this out through the Holy Spirit. And so Peter addresses Ananias and Sapphira. But first, he addresses Ananias. So verse Ananias, verse 3, Peter says this. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? And here's the important part uh, for our, our discussion tonight. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? So Peter had the, the privilege, the right to do whatever he wanted to at this because Peter, see, not Peter, Ananias, because Peter, the apostle who has authority in this situation, is saying it was yours. You could have done with it as you wanted and it would have been no problem. And then he goes on, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Why have you not lied to man but to God? So Peter makes two points here. First of all, the property was yours for you to do with as you wished. No one was forcing you to do this. You weren't excommunicated or not a believer if you would have hung on to it. And then even after you sold it, the money was yours. Again, to do with as you wished and you uh, chose to lie about it. That's the issue. Not that Ananias didn't give the whole amount, but that he lied about what he did. Um, and so um, clearly we've got here an evidence that to be a faithful member of, of the body, a faithful member of the church, you don't have to sell everything. Luke says it right there in just a few chapters. And then we look down at verse 46. He says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Well, clearly some of them weren't selling their homes because they were still meeting in their homes. So even though Peter sometimes... Or uh, uh, Luke sometimes uses the word all, and we'll see again later in this text where he uses the word all, and I don't think he means all. Um, he, he doesn't always mean all, every single person. Uh, so here in chapter 5, we've got the church isn't behaving that way, and even here in chapter 2, they're not all selling their property. So that's not really the point. The point of this is not to all get together, bring your stuff together, and to live in sort of a commune and, and that, that everything belongs to everyone. Also, the context is important. We just added 3,000 people to this number uh, of, of 120. So that's a radical difference, right? I mean, that's, that's a major difference. And think too, well, just think about this. Let's say that we added, um, and that was 3,000 people in a day. Let's say Parkview Christian Church added 300 people over the course of a month or two. Think about how much that would affect the functioning of Parkview Christian Church. Because we're talking here about um, unconverted people. We're not talking about 300 people joining Parkview Christian Church that moved here from Chickasha that were already faithful believers. We're talking about um, people that did not know Christ that now know Christ. Well, guess what? Those 300 people, probably not, the first thing they're going to do, probably not participating in tithing. Right? That's, that's usually something, as a Christian, you have to learn and grow into. And that increases uh, over your time and your relationship with God. So let's say we had 300 people, most of them not tithing. Just think about minor things that that would affect. Just something as simple as the cost of donuts on Sunday morning is now four times what it was. Or communion is four times what it was. Or our Thanksgiving dinner is now four times what it was. So those are small things. But you can see immediately there's a financial need that would, we'd have to meet. Um, if we had 300 people in a couple months, we couldn't all meet in here. We'd have to have two services or do something uh, because we couldn't all fit in here, 400 people. So you can see just adding 300 people to our church in our day and age would be a significant issue. So they had a 300 or 3,000 people in a time where people were not wealthy and, and, and just meeting basic needs, basic physical needs, um, was a challenge. So you could see why this church would have to do this. This wasn't just because they just did it because this is what the church does, but they did it because this is what this congregation needed. And so when we look at verses 45 and we see the selling of everything and, and holding all things in common, I think the takeaway isn't that personal property has to be sold. I think the takeaway is, uh, are or is the church, or our takeaway is, are we meeting needs? That's, that's the number one thing. Are there people in our congregation that are needy? Are we meeting those needs? And then um, are we considering the body more important than self? 
That's the picture here of these people, uh, that they're considering the whole as more important uh, than the individual. Um, and so uh, to, to apply that to the self might be to say something like this, um, am I willing uh, or, or do I have to hang on to sort of the luxuries of life at the sake of or at the cost of people in my congregation not having basic needs met? And the picture here is, no, that these people were willing to let go of any sort of luxuries or any sort of extra things to make sure that everyone had the basic needs met. Um, as one uh, commentator said, they're more food pantry than fellowship dinner. And I think that's a pretty good summation of this church. They're more about meeting needs uh, for fellowship than they are getting together and talking or hanging out. Um, but this is about real uh, family. And that the church is not a service that we attend, but the church is a family that we belong to. Uh, and that's the takeaway here. Uh, Luke is not prescribing us something, but he's describing for us how we ought to be. But in that describing and not prescribing, he does mention sort of four pillars of the church. And I think here we can say that it is okay to call them pillars of the church um, because it goes beyond Acts chapter 2. Again, when you go back to Paul's epistles, those four things that we'll look at here in the first verse, or the, the first verse of this text, uh, chapter, or verse 42, actually. Um, but our first verse for tonight, the four things that Paul mentions, or P, Luke mentions, are also mentioned in Paul's letters, required or commanded elsewhere. Um, and so that's why I think it's okay to say these things, this aspect, uh, these are more um, prescriptive. These are uh, pillars of the church. These are the things that we need to make sure that we're holding on to uh, precisely. I think verse 45 and 46 is more about attitudes and condition of the heart. And verse 42 is more about actual practices um, that must be uh, upheld and kept by the church. So let's look at verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to uh, the prayers. Um, so let's start with the first thing, the apostles' teaching. What are we talking about? Well, the apostles' teaching we just saw in uh, Luke's, or excuse me, Peter's sermon is Old Testament, obviously. Luke, uh, Peter, Peter uh, quotes and several prophecies, and you will see that uh, again throughout the sermons in the book of Acts, and then the gospel. So we're talking about essentially for us would be the word of God, the Old Testament, um, the gospel. And then we get into Paul. Was we, we talked about this a few, as several months ago, actually, in Sunday school. Paul seems to think that, that his, um, what he's writing is counted as scripture. Um, and so we could, I think we can just say all the New Testament, we're talking about the apostles' teaching. We're talking about devotion to the word of God for us in our context. That's what we're talking about. Devotion to the Old and the New Testament, um, especially the gospel. Then we've got fellowship. This, to me, is probably the, the most um, difficult of these to understand uh, because we just don't have a very good equivalent word in the English for fellowship. Or the, word, the Greek word is koinonia. And so um, we use the word fellowship here. Uh, but in just a second, I'm going to point out to you that koinonia means many things. Uh, it doesn't just mean fellowship. And certainly not fellowship, I guess, in the way that we think about it as we think about a fellowship dinner or just kind of um, being together. Uh, I, I think at its most basic level, it's just deep, deep friendship uh, but even that is not exactly quite right. So flip over to Philippians chapter 2. And this gives us a little bit of sense of what koinonia is, what, what this fellowship is. Philippians chapter 2 beginning in verse 1 says this. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, which that's the word koinonia, any koinonia in the spirit, any affection and sympathy... So if you've got any of that through Jesus, which koinonia with the Spirit, you've got this deep relationship, this deep intimacy, then here's what ought to flow out of that. Verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being, a full, being in full accord and of one mind. So we've got this koinonia, fellowship with Jesus and the Spirit. So whatever it is that we've got with Jesus, 
and the Spirit, that's the same word that Luke is using to describe the relationship that the church had with each other. So right off the bat, we know that whatever this is, is a deep and lasting and important relationship. Um, but, but Paul here says that what flows out of that koinonia with Christ is koinonia for one another, that you're like-minded, that you have the same purpose, and that you're serving together. That's verse 2 there, Philippians chapter 1, verse 2. That's what koinonia looks like. Now, let's check out a couple other verses. Go to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 13. Nope, I'm in First Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Okay? So, again, talking about the fellowship. Here's the word koinonia, the fellowship that we have with the Holy Spirit um, and that the, the Spirit has not only with us, but with God and Christ, because he's mentioned the Trinity here, the fellowship that those three share, may that be um, with you all. Well, the fellowship that they share is a communion, a togetherness that cannot be broken, right? And in fact, it's communion and togetherness that is um, so one that we say that they are one in nature. No, we don't just say that. The Bible says that. But we talk about those three being one in nature, three persons, but one nature, um, one God. So that's a picture of fellowship, the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Go to Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. It says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Well, the, the, the verb or the word that we uh, translate share here is actually the word koinonia. So don't neglect to do good. And koinonia, what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So koinonia is self-sacrifice for the good of the others, um, specifically and personal possessions. Romans chapter 15, verse 26. Paul's uh, written to a number of churches uh, about this offering that he's hoping to collect um, for some other churches. And he writes to uh, the churches in Rome as well. And uh, Romans chapter 15 verse 26 says this. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. Well that word contribution is the word koinonia. And so again here, koinonia is about a gift. Um, it's about sharing and generosity. First John chapter 1 verse 7. Says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, Jesus, we have fellowship with one another. We have koinonia with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we have fellowship with one another if we walk in the light in the same way that Jesus does. So we're talking again about the same kind of intimacy that we have with Jesus. We share with one another by walking in the light uh, of Jesus. And now let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 46. And we get a little bit of an idea of what that koinonia, that fellowship, uh, actually looks like, how it played out in the day to day. It says this, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So, what are they doing? They're meeting together in the temple. Uh, and the temple prayers were three times at that, or three times a day at that point. So, these, these believers are meeting together three times a day at the temple. They're also meeting in each other's homes, uh, sharing food, uh, sharing a meal. And so the, the idea that we see here is that this group of people could not wait to get together. Like Sunday wasn't enough. Wednesday wasn't enough. We need each other all the time. We love to be in each other's presence. We love to care for one another. And so all those things, that's why fellowship is just a really... A, not strong enough word to get at what koinonia is because koinonia means a lot of things uh, in scripture and all those things that it means is what this church was devoting themselves to in, in, in their, their behavior towards one another just a deep love and commitment to one another sacrificing self sacrificing comfort for the good and the benefit of one another but, but also 
like deeply enjoying each other. And I think that's an important part. Um, I mean, this church is for sure good at, I think, meeting needs. Uh, I've, for the 20, whatever, four years, I guess it is, that I've been here, I mean, I can't ever remember a time where there was a person that had a need that people knew about that wasn't met just super quickly or anything, whether that was a van or the, the youth building or carpet or whatever. Anytime we've ever said, hey, we need this money, that it didn't come pretty quickly. Um, and this church, you know, has never, as far as I know, never been in debt, never had to take out a loan. I think that's accurate, but certainly not. If they have, it was a long time ago. Um, and so uh, the generosity of this church, very good. Um, and I'm not saying that the other part isn't, by the way. But generosity is like base level. Um, it needs to be generosity with enjoying each other, really loving each other's presence. And I think that's what fellowship is. One of the reasons I pray before our meals a lot of times, I pray that we'll enjoy God's uh, presence and we'll enjoy the presence of one another. That's, that's what fellowship is, loving one another. So they were devoted to that. They were devoted um, to fellowship. And I guess just to end on fellowship, I would just say this. Fellowship in the early church was radical. I mean, to, to have a fellowship dinner or to have donuts and coffee before Sunday school, that's scratching the surface, you know. Fellowship in the early church was radical, and that's uh, the important thing for us. Not so much are we selling everything and getting everything away, but do we have radical love and, and care for one another? So we got um, the, the apostles' teaching, the apostles' doctrine. We got fellowship, and then we've got the breaking of bread. Uh, there's um, pretty good discussion. What does this mean? Does this simply mean meals, or is this talking about the Lord's Supper? Uh, I personally believe this is talking about the Lord's Supper for a couple of reasons. For, well, one is, if you go down to uh, verse 46, Luke brings up meals and talks about their sharing the meals just daily in the home. Almost as if that's a separate thing from what's going on in verse 42. The other reason I think that they're talking about uh, the Lord's Supper here is because um, in the early church, the Lord's Supper was part of the meal. It wasn't separate. It wasn't, they didn't practice it like we do where they took a time out and they said, okay, now it's communion time. They had a meal and the, the wine of the meal and the meal bread was what they used for communion. They practiced essentially like Jesus would have practiced at the Last Supper. The Last Supper was an actual supper where they ate, and Jesus took the bread and the wine of that supper and lifted it up and broke it and blessed it, and he gave that. But he didn't take a time out and say, here's a cracker and a juice, and this is separate from this other thing. Um, so the, just the way the early church practiced communion, it was part of the meal. So even if we're just talking about the meal, I think we're talking about communion, and um, we'll get there in a minute, but we see this in 1 Corinthians. This is one of the things that Paul gets onto the church in Corinthians is because they're messing up the meal because they're messing up communion. And that's Paul's real problem with it. Uh, but the other reason is if you just look at verse 42, um, you'll see the word the there a couple times in relation to, um, well, you see it one time. It depends on what translation you're using. The ESV, uh, it's translated the breaking of bread. Um, if the Greek actually says the breaking of the bread, and it's a definitive article. So Luke here is saying we're talking about a specific breaking of a specific bread. And I think if he's saying the breaking of the bread, uh, the, the idea, the thing he's pointing to is the bread of the Last Supper. Um, and so um, they devoted themselves to communion. Uh, they devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper. So we'll come back to that in just a minute, but that's, I think, a pretty easy thing for us to understand. And then the final thing is prayer. And again, not a difficult thing for us to understand. We all know what prayer is. They're devoted to it. The one thing I would point out is you see there that the word, at least in the ESV, is um, plural. They devoted themselves to the prayers. Again, definitive article. So we're talking about specific prayers. Um, and so uh, that's important because we know that we, 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 from writings that the church had specific prayers that they prayed together. So like the Lord's Prayer would be one of them. They had songs that they sung together. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, um, the... Uh, you know, have this mind among you. And then he says, um, 
who though he was in form of God, did not count himself equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form. He humbled himself to death by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then he continues on with Jesus having the name that is above every other name. Uh, in a lot of translations, that's in quotations, because that's either one of two things. Uh, that's not original to Paul. That's an, an other ancient text, and we believe that to either be one of the first worship songs of the church or it was a prayer it's hard to it's hard to know because we don't know if they were singing it or or praying it or or sort of reciting it but that's that's ancient literature for i mean liturgy um from the early church and so the church had prayers that they prayed um wrote prayers that they prayed regularly uh and so you know i think that's a good thing would be a good thing for us to do but maybe the most important part and we talked about this the first week so i won't a harp on it too much is these are communal prayers this is again not a prayer life that is simply individualistic going home saying my prayers at mealtime or nighttime those things are great obviously um, but what they this church has devoted themselves to is prayer together um, and I think that's uh, certainly something that we could uh, add to our uh, worship here in our body of uh, believers so uh, that's an important thing but Uh, I think we probably have a pretty good grasp on those four things. The two important realities about those are those four things. The apostles' doctrine, uh, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers um, come right before and right after that. So two things. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to these things. So the first thing, they were devoted to them. Okay, This is not casual indifference. This is not bored uh, formality. Um, You know, every time we have a communion thought, our, our, our a man that comes up here, generally speaking, encourages us to get our mind right. And partly because that's biblical. Um, Paul talks about, you know, doing this in, in, in the right uh, way with the right thinking about Christ. Um, but we don't ever want communion to become a formal thing. We don't ever want it to become uh, a routine thing. And so we want to set our mind right. So part of that devotion is that, that it just, it just never becomes a formal, you know, uh, or something that becomes we're indifferent to or just becomes a rote sort of repetition kind of thing. But it is regular, and the other part of that is it's intentional. So if you're devoted to something, uh, it, you, you do it or participate in it with regularity, and you're intentional about it. So and I, you know, I think by the most obvious sort of analogy here is marriage, or, or just your children. If you're devoted To your spouse, you're devoted to your children. You know what that means, that you show up regularly. Um, Not just that you're there. Again, there's a lot of of marriages where both people are are physically present, but the marriage is is poor because they're not really there. There's there's regular communion, um, regular devotion to that, um, being present, um, but also... Um, being intentional about it. One thing you find out as a husband is like listening to your wife is one thing, but listening to her and responding to her and letting her know that you heard her and that you understand her, that's a whole different level, right? And, and women respect that. Men respect that too, but we're just made different. Um, and, and that's being... Uh, intentional about that time and that moment that I'm not just here but I'm making the best of I'm making the most of it Uh, I'm doing this for a purpose okay and so we do that in our marriages we do that with our children that's the idea here we do these four things with regularity and intentionality and maybe the most important thing is verse 43 this might be the most important phrase in all of this verse 43 awe came upon every soul that every one of these people was filled with awe Uh, they were filled with awe this idea of glorifying god and then jump down to 46 and we see it in their actual day to day when they're attending the temple together and they're eating meals together it said they received their food with glad and generous hearts so you've got awe and glad and generosity you've got thankfulness and gratitude what we're talking about what luke is describing here is a heart of worship that in everything they're doing they're declaring the worth of God. And what they taught and how they behaved, it's all about declaring the worth of God. It's about worship. 
So when we think about worship, there's this vertical aspect where we're lifting up God, making much of God, declaring his praises and making his name what more, you know, more well known into all of creation, which is what uh, we're put here for in, in Genesis chapter uh, 1 and 2. We work in creation to make uh, God more well known. But then there's also this horizontal part, right, where the part of proclaiming God's name is to bless those around us. And Adam and Eve blessed one another, and they were to bless their children. Um, and so we've got this horizontal aspect of worship. So go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So one of the ways that we teach and admonish one another is not just by teaching, but by singing, by worshiping psalms, spiritual songs, and hymns. Uh, and so psalms, that's, that's easily understood. Um, hymns, the best we can tell, that these three things are a little bit hard to define, but the best we can understand that Psalms is clearly the book of Psalms. We're singing and, and praying those things. Hymns would be um, songs that are uh, just direct praises of God. It's just you're all talking about the nature of God. So that's where we get a little bit confused in our language. We, hymns is anything that's in the hymnal. That's not quite accurate. Um, a spiritual song would be a song that describes a spiritual truth that is not 100% about declaring the glory of God. So I'll fly away. I'll fly away, frankly, is more about us than it is about God. It's about the condition of what's going to happen to us. It's true and it's good and it's praiseworthy. Um, but we call it a hymn because it's a hymnal. And this uh, you know, if we press it up against this, it's not really him. It'd be more of a spiritual song, but it still it fits in here because it's a, you know, it fits in with these three things. But the point is this: we sing these things over each other. We worship to build each other up. Let's go to Ephesians uh, chapter five, verse nineteen. Ephesians chapter five, verse nineteen. Paul essentially says the exact same thing to the church in Ephesus that he said to the church in Colossae: address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing and make melody to the Lord with your heart. So again, we're addressing each other. He doesn't just say do this uh, to make much of God. He says do these things to address one another, to worship, uh, to worship God, but to build each other up. Now. Uh, both those things, Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians chapter 3, both Paul obviously, both almost word for word the exact same command that he's given to both those churches. So we know it must be important. And here's the kind of interesting thing. If you look at Colossians, or if you, if you went there, uh, if you're in Ephesians chapter 5, you see that, that there's one verse, or two verses I guess, and then the next verse is, wives submit to your husbands. Colossians chapter 3, the exact same thing. We've got the seeing... Um, Sing the songs, the hymns, and the spiritual songs over one another. And then the, the very next thing, the very next thought, verse 18, wives submit to your husbands. So we get into the household rules, okay? So Paul apparently thinks that this whole idea of worshiping and blessing one another with worship is super important because he repeats it. But also both times he connects it to how we relate to one another, not just in the church, but within our families. And so here we've got this idea of worship in Acts chapter 2. They're filled with awe and gladness and thanksgiving. And you say, well, why do they have such deep fellowship? I think it flows out of their worship. That their love for God flowed so much out of them that it was building each other up. And, and uh, if I could use, I won't use names, I don't want to embarrass anyone. Uh, but I've, I've told you uh, several times that one of the biggest blessings that I get from this church is the prayer cards. Um, I, just so you know, I never put my name up there. So I don't feel blessed in that way. Um, and I've never been up there. I'm blessed. I love watching people come pray for other people. It, I can't tell you what it does for me throughout the week. I love watching. I love the fact that, you know, we'll have 80-year-olds come down and a five-year-old come down. I love that. I love that husbands and wives come down together. I love that moms and dads and kids come down together. It's such a blessing um, to see that. The other day, uh, three, I don't know, three weeks ago or something like that, um, and I sit right there, so I see all this, um, but I wasn't watching. I just saw it. But um, these two ladies came up here separate. They weren't together. 
uh, they weren't, I don't think they were praying for the same person even, even but they uh, just held each other, just hugged each other. I think they were maybe cried. Not that crying makes anything better, but you know, was, there was something deep and powerful going on there, and it even ended with a kiss on the cheek. But it ended with, what well, I think what we would call a holy kiss, seriously. And uh, I mean, it was just a powerful moment of community, but it was worship. I mean, it was worship that brought that together. Um, and I, I thought about it for a few weeks, and finally I just texted him and said, I just, just got to let you know. I've been, I've been thriving off watching that for two weeks now, so I just want to let you know. Um, but it, I had nothing to do with that. But it brought encouragement to me, and it built me up. I sat in my office, I was writing my sermon, you know. And sometimes you get to a point and you're like, ah, I don't want to do this. I don't, you know, not I'm typing and I don't know what to say. And, and I thought about that and I'd be like, oh, and I'd get going, you know, and I'd be, I'd be rejuvenated a little bit. Our worship washes over one another. That's the way that God has designed it. And I think that's one of the reasons that this, um, this church here in Acts chapter 2 was so um, just sort of fruitful and thriving because the heart that was there was not ultimately a heart for one another, it was a heart for worship, which led to a heart for one another. Um, and so worship and awe, and I just, real quick, we're almost finished here, but let's take those four pillars real quick and just think about what happens if you remove worship or awe from those things. So if you've got the apostles' teaching, and we've got biblical examples here, you've got the apostles' teaching, the word of God, if you take awe out of that, if you take worship out of study, what have you got? You've got an intellectual or an academic pursuit. That's what you've got. First Timothy chapter six, Paul writes and says, um, you know, don't let people, don't, don't, don't deal with people like this. If people are, are teaching a doctrine that's, that's different than this, all they're really doing is becoming puffed up and they're causing quarrels and divisions and friction, strife, right? Because they're doing it for their own glory. They're doing it to, um, this, Paul says they're quarreling over words. They're doing it to show themselves to be smart. Um, if you take awe out of the apostles' teaching, all you're left with uh, is um, an academic pursuit, an intellectual pursuit uh, that is filled with pride and arrogance. If you take worship out of fellowship, uh, you go to James chapter 2. What does James say? Someone comes into your fellowship and they look nice, that they're rich or whatever. You give them the, the good seat, but, but you kick out you know, the person that looks like, like they're poor. Or you give them the bad seat and you sort of neglect them. Why would you do that? Well, because you're not really there for God and worship. You're there uh, to celebrate man. If you take awe out of uh, fellowship, then what you're left with is a club and not a family. Uh, if you take awe out of the breaking of bread, if you take the awe and the worship out of communion, then you're left with the practice. And, and we saw, and this is what I said, we'll get to it. In 1 Corinthians, Paul's issue, one of Paul's issues with the church in Corinth is that people are just uh, showing up to that dinner early and they're just uh, chowing down, and, and people are, you know, getting drunk on the wine. They're eating all the bread. And so by the time, you know, the people at the end get to the meal, they can't even take communion. They can't take the Lord's Supper. And Paul's point is, listen, the, the, point, the meal is good, but, I mean, you're not doing this to get full. You're doing this to share. This isn't a party. So get your needs met. Have the Lord's Supper. But you're... you're, you're keeping other people from taking the Lord's Supper because of your own greed. And if this thing becomes, you know, if communion becomes uh, aweless or uh, without worship, then it just becomes self-indulgence. And prayers without awe, prayers without worship uh, are self-righteous, uh, pharisaical behavior. Remember when the Pharisee says uh, to, to praise to God, thank God that I'm not like this tax collector. And what's the tax collector say? God have mercy on me, a sinner. Who was worshiping? The tax collector. Because he understood who he was in the presence of God. He was a sinner in need of mercy. The Pharisee had no worship and he was, um, uh, again, considered or consumed with self. And so if we take awe out of any of these things, if we take worship out of any of these things, they all get perverted uh, and messed up. So we've got two things here, devotion, regular and intentional, and we've got worship. The point is that this church... This is the big takeaway for us. This church was regular and intentional about glorifying God. And in that, they found success in all the things that they were doing. Um, and so I guess the question for us would be, are we intentional about God's glory in all the things that we do? 
And we need to think about that as individuals. I think it's good to think about that as a church. Um, you know, uh, just doing things because it's what we do is, is really not fruitful. Doing things because we're intentional about God's glory in those things is where we'll find fruit. And this church found fruit. Look what happens in verse 47. It says, they praised God and they found favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They found favor with all the people. Uh, apparently, this unity and this fellowship was attractive to the people outside of the church. Now, again, here's where uh, Luke uses the word all, and I don't think he means all because all you have to do is turn the page in the book of Acts, and the very next thing you see is Peter and John are getting dragged before the council um, and being threatened physically and being told not to preach the gospel. So, they weren't technically finding favor with every single person. But the people that were around them, they were finding favor with. Um, that, that this was so attractive, the fellowship that they had because of the worship that was going on within this church. And because of it, the Lord worked. And I think that's an important thing here. That's why we end with this verse, I think. Luke says, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Not only was Jesus in their midst, but because they had their hearts right, about the way the church ought to function, Jesus was doing work and going beyond adding the 3,000, but adding day by day people to their number. Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you so much again for being you, and I just want to pray uh, that you would, through your spirit, work in us, uh, convict us when we're, when we're wrong. God, show us uh, where we need correction, encourage us where we're doing well, and help us to continue on and to um, um, strive for... Um, your holiness in all things, your glory in all things, God. Uh, I'm so thankful to be a part of this church. I'm thankful for the relationships that not only I have, but that I see between other people, God. Uh, thank you for the love here. Um, grow that in us. Um, just give us a deeper desire and a deeper longing to be with one another, to love with one another, to share with one another. Um, uh, remove any self-centeredness from my heart and from the hearts of uh, your people, God, and make us dedicated to you and to one another. Uh, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.